Okay, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today, Secretary Kelly Schultz. She brings a wealth of knowledge to the Maryland Department of Commerce from her years of experience working in the government, in the private sector, and as a small business owner. You could have had her here at the CEO Club of Baltimore. We had known that. Previously, she served as the Secretary of Maryland Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation, otherwise known as DLLR. At DLLR, she was responsible for managing an agency with nearly 2,000 employees and an operating budget of over $375 million. That's a nice sized company, to say the least. But under her leadership, Maryland's apprenticeship pro program grew to its highest level since 2008. And DLLR's Employment Advancement Maryland program received national recognition for both innovation and effectiveness and was named one of the top 25 programs in the 2018 Innovations and in American Government Award Competition. Now, who knew that it was an award competition for the government? Anybody? <laughs> I did. <laughs> That's amazing. And congratulations. She's a former member of the House of Delegates, representing Frederick County, and served on the Economic Matters Committee from 2011 to 2015. Then Delegate Schultz took special interest in legislation relating to banks and other financial institutions, business, and economic development. Prior to embarking on a career of public service, Secretary Schultz sold real estate, worked as a program manager for a defense contractor, and was a part owner of a cybersecurity firm. She really has tremendous experience. She's also received numerous awards, including the Outstanding Recent Alumni Award from Hood College in 2011. She's also, and again, this is where it comes in, Marty, you can appreciate it, all the community events. She's proud to participate in many local community organizations, including the Liberty Town Unionville Lions Club and the Walkersville Vi Volunteer Fire Company. And she's a past member, board member of the Frederick County of Habitat for Humanity. Maybe she's worked with Jimmy Carter building some of those houses. She has an associate's degree from Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York, and later received her BA degree in political science from Hood College in Frederick, Maryland. She's a native of Warren, Michigan, currently lives in Frederick County, Maryland with her husband and two sons. And wow, what a background. Welcome, Secretary Schultz, being here with us. You know, our I good think we're done. There's nothing left really to say. <laughs> You've done it all, I can tell you no. that. You know, our good friend, my good friend, Mike Gill, former uh, director, uh, Secretary of Commerce, I know was there for four years. How's he doing? And did he leave the, the, the department in good hands for you to take over? <laughs> I don't think Mike Gill has ever had a bad day in his entire life. So I'm, I'm assuming that he's doing pretty well right about now today. Um, I know that he loves being back in the private sector. He's so good at what he does. And, and it was a joy to come into the Department of Commerce and kind of just pick up on the foundation that was there and continue to move forward with what the administration and the governor wants to do. So it's been good. It's been good. But I'm sure that he misses all of you, but you guys probably see him every day anyway. I see him out and about all the time, running around the streets, and um, he's making big things happen. Yeah, he's a great guy. He was a great member of the CEO Club for many years. But let's talk a little bit about what's happening with your department now. Governor Hogan took office over five years ago. He pledged to make Maryland a more welcoming place to do business. What steps have you taken to really make that happen? How is it happening now? Gosh, we've done so much. So going back to 2015, when all of the fun started uh, for all of us, the governor really did plant the flag to say Maryland is open for business. And it was up to the entire state, all of the agencies, to really pull together to make that open for business a reality. So I can tell you at the very beginning, um, everybody has probably heard about this, but we, we did a major effort with regulatory reform. We cut across state agencies. 850 regulations. A big chunk wow. of those, obviously, in the Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation, as you might ma imagine. But we did that two years in a row. And that was a great exercise for us to just start out in the administration. It helped us to uh, identify the path moving forward. The governor has cut cut taxes and cut tolls and fees. Um, all of that to say uh, we wanted to be able to very publicly say that we are the state to come to do business in, even though they may not have heard of that before. And then to formalize that open for business process, um, we 
had the creation of the Maryland Marketing Partnership. Right. And that marketing partnership, it's a public-private partnership where private industry and the state work together on marketing the state. And that's where we formalized the Open for Business campaign. Hopefully everybody in here has seen somewhere the Open for Business campaign. A nod of heads. Yes. Okay, good. Um, and then we kind of picked up on that. Um, in this past year, we um, are developing and marketing, not only in the state of Maryland, but across the country, our tourism campaign, which picks up on the Open for Business um, experience, and it's open for it at this point in time. And it's, and it's the same theme and wanting to make sure that people know that, you know, doing business here is we have a great, wonderful environment in order to be able to work, live, play, and explore. All the good things. All the good things. Do you feel the efforts are gaining the results? Are you getting the results that you want? I know the governor always wants more. Uh, where are you with that? Uh, we, we have more. Uh, I guess it's been almost two weeks ago, our jobs numbers came out for the month of September. In the month of September, Maryland created 10,100 jobs. Wow. That's huge. That's the most significant increase in jobs since 2015, so we're really excited about that. The month of August, the state of Maryland created 9,000 jobs. So in two months, Maryland has created almost 20,000 jobs. And I think that's a really big benefit for all of us to be able to see. There's other indicators as well, right? I mean, going from, everyone's heard the governor say it, going from losing 100,000 jobs over the previous eight years to gaining over now 126,000 jobs. Wow. That, that's really big, big steps. But anecdotally, we see it as well. We see it with the, the vibe in the business community and people coming up and, and working and making that contact with the Department of Commerce and other agencies uh, to see how they can be a part of the excitement. You see the innovative world, you know, those clusters that are around our university systems, all of those entrepreneurs and the innovative hub of sure. Maryland starting to, to catch on fire. And I think that's exciting to see. You know, there's a lot of talk, you hear it, you know, on TV, radio, and so forth, that, you know, there's, there's going to be a decline in the marketplace, you know, there's going to be the big R word down the road. Do you see any of that? I mean, I know market had a nice hit yesterday, and it's... Yeah. You know, it's hard for me to say if we see that at the level where we are. Uh, I know that our list of major projects of site selectors and um, individuals that are coming to the department in order to be able to stake out those locations for everything from major headquarters to mid-sized uh, businesses that are coming through and all different regions of the state, by the way. There's no particular area that is the most on fire in the state. Um, we, we continue to see that major list major project was grow. Hmm. So there's a lot of people that are out there looking and Maryland is making it to those final selection stages at this point in time more frequently. I do know that obviously I'm not an economist. Um, my son and my husband are economists. I'm not. Um, but I know that there's going to eventually be a downturn. And I think it's up to us to be able to prepare for that, to be able to understand how do we um, diversify ourselves and protect those businesses that are currently here to make sure that they're going to be protected for whatever comes up their way. Makes sense. You know, you spent four years as a secretary of labor. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what you learned about Maryland business specifically, their needs, the challenges they face, and the opportunities and so forth. Well, when I was at the Department of Labor, I constantly reminded Secretary Gill that you cannot have economic development without workforce development. Now that I'm at the Department of Commerce, I say, well, you can't have workforce development without economic <laughs> development, right? And it, but but it all, it all, it, but it, it's that it's that wonderful word that that ecosystem that we create um, amongst all of our state agencies. Now, in 2015, the governor created the governor's sub cabinet. And the sub-cabinet is um, made up of 10 state agency um, cabinet members, um, advisors to the governor. And our job is to talk to each other about what we see in the economic development world and the business community. And everything from the Department of Transportation, the Department of Housing Community Development, the Department of Labor, the Department of the Environment, everyone that has a touch or a feel to that business community in some way. And every single one of us the, the number one question, no matter who you are, that someone's going to come up and talk to you about what their pain point is right now, is workforce. 
You cannot get enough workers or you cannot get those workers that are skilled. Right, Marty? That's, oh, yeah. that's the number one thing. So at the Department of Labor, I was able to work with that community that was, that was training and developing those individuals to satisfy the needs of the businesses. Now in this role, I can use those experiences that I had at the Department of Labor to direct them in those ways, but also to help to look for different um, types of tools that might be uh, more beneficial for them, connect them more readily to those programs that, um, that are already set up and thriving. Super, it's a perfect segue. You know, you're now, you made the transition, you're now the Secretary of Commerce. What's your vision now for the department? I and mean, how are you gonna take it to the next level? You know, what's the challenges that the business community may face, may face and how are you gonna overcome them? Well, what I understand for businesses in general is that time is money, right? And so the longer you have to sit and suffer trying to figure out an issue, any type of problem that's happening um, in your business world, the more money it's going to cost you. So we are trying to be able to resolve those issues um, and make opportunities out of them. And that's another part of the Commerce's subcabinet. We formalized a process with all of our liaisons that are in, in regions and in counties all across the state to be able to put them in specific teams. So they work together, all of those agencies, liaisons, there's over a hundred of them in the state that are put wow. into regional resource teams and they're helping to solve problems fast. And then where they're seeing themes in different areas that may be the bigger pain points, say if there's a big problem in Frederick County that's happening, then the, the cabinet level, the secretaries can work together in order to be able to say, you know what, let's try to resolve that in the policy world so that we can remove that hurdle, that pain point from what's happening with the businesses. So I say when we move, when I see a vision of commerce moving forward, commerce is out there expanding uh, retaining and attracting new businesses, right? So those are our three, three opportunities. But the retaining of those businesses right now is a really big priority because of that customer service pledge that the governor has. How can we make our businesses here? It, let, if our if our if our tax system is not going to be as competitive and as beneficial as another state, what can we do in order to be able to compensate for that by providing additional types of resources? And that's where we're moving in the future. Excellent point. You know, you're talking about the concept of customer service, and I know I've talked with Mike about this, and we talked to the, with the governor. The concept, and the governor's a businessman as well. The concept that. The government serves its constituents, exactly. people like us. And we've all been on the phone to call on government agencies. You might be on hold for about two hours <laughs> if you get through. But it's so important that you get a call, you get the customer service, and they're responsive. I, mean, I know many years ago uh, when Mayor Schaefer was the mayor and then he was the governor, I remember one time I wrote a letter to the, uh, when he was mayor. I got a response back within the 24 hours, and then I got a follow-up call was my matter resolved? That's great. How are you guys doing that? And to really get the responsiveness so people can feel like we're being served. It's such a critical juncture. It took a lot of training. I mean, and when the governor made that pledge at the end of 2015, it, it was it's a poster. If you walk into a government agency right now, a state agency, you're going to see that poster no matter what agency you're in. And it says that we pledge to do all of those things that um, is going to create the best experience for our customer. The first step, and being at the Department of Labor during that period of time, it was very interesting because those of you that have ever had to work with the Department of Labor in their licensing office or um, perhaps Mosh or perhaps the Employment Standards or Unemployment Insurance, there's some pretty tricky offices that, you know, are trying to create good customer service over there because typically when people call us, they're mad at us already. Um, but the first part of that training was to make sure that every single one of our state employees knew that there actually was a customer. Right. So you can't have customer service unless you realize that there's a customer. And there was a, a, a lot of training that went on, uh, mandatory training. We made it mandatory that every six months, every single person had to check a box and go to a customer service training. Wow. We had in-house um, trainers at that point in time just to get the message across. And then we would do things like give out customer service awards to those employees that were doing it really well and make a big spectacle out of it, right? And making sure people understand. Understood. But it was it was an educational process first. And so then we developed at the 
state level a survey. So any one of us in the state government that sends you an email that you have our email address, at the bottom of it is a link to a survey, an electronic survey. And you can click on that survey and you can say whatever you want. Try to be nice, but because I mean, <laughs> nice it gets recorded, and you know we get these sheets at the end of the month that tell us how everybody's doing, and so you're able to use that as a management tool, basically. I mean, it gave us a baseline as to where we were as a state when it came to our customer service, our levels, but it also um, provided us with that management tool because someone will say such and such employee said this to me, and it really made me angry. So. We go back to employee X and say, you know, what you said really made that person angry. Let's work on that a little bit. And um, I think that that's been really helpful. Right now, uh, that customer survey, um, those responses, I believe the state as a whole, all agencies, I mean, including the Department of Labor now, the Department of Transportation, <coughs> including MVA, all of that combined, I believe we have about an 87% thumbs up approval rating wow. for state agencies. And that's really exciting. That's fantastic. That is. Talk a little bit more about, you know, what you guys do to retain businesses here in, in the state as well as attract new businesses. I know it was a great save with Marriott Corporation, I guess, about a year ago, which was a huge, huge thing. Right. They threatened to leave with the corporate headquarters. What else? What else are you working on to try to retain? So it, it's always great. It's like in, in business. It's always great to get new business. But if you're losing a lot of business at the same time, it may just even out. Yeah. What do you do to make sure that you're always on the upswing? Yeah, so part of retaining that business is just what, a lot of that is customer service, but we do have internal programs that are helpful to uh, companies across the board, whether that's retaining them or helping them expand or attracting new businesses. We have tax credit programs, right? We have loan, um, loan guarantees. We have different types of incentive programs that we put out there. Job creation is what we try to do. Right. So all of the incentives, all of those packages, it's based on we want a business to come to us and say, we're going to create 20 new jobs in two years. So we're going to say, OK, that's great. Job creation is what the Department of Commerce is all about. So we're going to offer you this plan, this plan, and this plan. And that's going to either give you some tax credits or it's going to give you a loan forgiveness at, at, at the end of five years if you retain those jobs. Something that's going to be beneficial to you in order to be able to create those jobs. And um, one such program, which some of you in the room may know about, is the More Jobs for Marylanders. More Jobs for Marylanders is a, um, is a, is a tax tax credit program to those businesses. Originally, the governor created the program to attract more manufacturers into the state of Maryland. And it gives you a percentage now of the, uh, the payroll if you have uh, jobs that are created in the manufacturing world. Last year, we expanded the program um, to cover any industry. So if your business um, wants to utilize and you want to grow in an opportunity zone, let's just say, sure. then it, no matter if you're a manufacturing company or somebody else, you're going to be able to benefit from that immediate, you know, um, after one year of uh, retaining those employees, uh, get those tax credits. And businesses seem to be benefiting from that. Having focused on manufacturing with the More Jobs for Marylanders over the last three years, uh, Maryland has, re has seen the second highest percentage increase in manufacturing in the wow. eastern part of the United States, second only to South Carolina. Now, the numbers aren't the same, right? But the percentage are very high in what we're being able to see, which means companies are starting to look at Maryland as a very friendly place to come and do business, whether it's a traditional manufacturer, advanced manufacturing at this point in time, and specifically in pharmaceutical manufacturing. Tremendous. Talk a little bit about, I guess it's a fine line, you know, when Amazon was looking at other headquarters, you know, in New York and Montgomery County was in play for a while, and I think it made it down to the last few spots. How do you know when you've maybe given too much <laughs> or have, it, you have given not enough? Because, you know, there was all kinds of uh, news media. Maryland's given away the farm, you know, and yeah. we're attracting this, this company. In that particular case, it was Amazon. How do you come up with that 
magical formula? Well, if you take Amazon out of it, because I think Amazon knew what Amazon wanted to do before they ever even started looking at other states' um, packages and what they were doing. So I'm a little bit of a skeptic on the Amazon thing. But with some of the other businesses that we're competing with, we look at a lot of things. We have subject matter experts um, in the department um, right now that understand everything about the market that these businesses may be in, understand um, Usually, they're already well-established companies that are coming to us and established types of investors that they're able to look into. They understand how much capital they're putting into the project, so there would be less risk with us putting some money in if we know that it's a very high capital um, intensive type project. And you have to balance that out, and um, it goes through a lot of review processes internally amongst different departments in order to be able to say. Some of it, obviously, is determined by statute. Right? I mean, for the sheer fact that you use the uh, more jobs for Marylanders, let's just say, there is a specific percentage, 5.75% of your payroll that you're getting back. So that's a defined amount that we would know based on the number of jobs that they're giving. So it would not be um, ambiguous on our part. It would, it would be a, a defined term, depending on what their creation is going to be. And they're going to meet certain... They have to meet certain, certain barriers. To minimum standards they have to meet, a metrics. So if they're going to say that they're going to create 200 jobs, they're going to get some maybe loan um, forgiveness loans that, that are up front. They're going to get that. They have to meet that for a period of time based on the contract because everybody goes into a contract. And they have to meet those standards. And our team reviews those standards every year to make sure that they have met those requirements, working with the Department of Labor to get employment records, for example. Um, and then they will receive at the end of the year what, what they had said they would receive. And if they don't, then they don't get the incentives. Follow-up, which is the key. That's Fo what you do. Follow-up is the key. That's <laughs> Let it. Let me ask you one more question, then we'll turn sure. it over to the audience. What's coming up for the future? What's, what's new and innovative and exciting that the... Uh, Maryland Department of Commerce is going to be doing in the next year, two years, three years? I would say a couple of things. Um, opportunity zones um, is a big thing right now. Maryland has 149 opportunity zones. We've been working really hard with the Department of Housing and Community Development on uh, marketing what those opportunity zones are. Some of them are going to be more marketable than others. We created some stackable incentives, the first state in the nation to do so last year. Um, the governor wanted to be able to make sure that you're going to get more incentives if you're working in an opportunity zone. Just to make them a little bit more enticing other than investors investing in other states, right? If you're going to invest, we're going to give you a little bit more here in the state of Maryland to be able to do that. And we're starting to see some action come from that, which is exciting. Uh, I think the other side, and this is kind of my, my personal way of, of moving forward, is, you know, what does that whole innovative world look like out there? that the world of the small business, the entrepreneur, those businesses that are coming up and being created out of our university systems, out of our federal laboratories. Sure. We have more federal labs than any other state in the nation. We have um, incubators, it seems like, in every tucked away in every corner of the world. But you know, those are kind of the cool kids on the block right now. Right? They're the ones that can grow from zero to 100 in six months sometimes, depending on what type of um, financing investments that they're getting. How do we attract them and keep them here and make sure that they know that this region really is that cool place for them to, to start up? We don't need the ventures to come in here and invest in these companies and ask them politely, to, or sometimes impolitely, to move out to Silicon Valley because that's where they think they should be because that's where the investors are. We have the infrastructure here, working with our, our TEDCO partners, working with our university partners, getting more aggressive with um, that talent is going to help us, I think, prepare for whatever might be down the road with some sort of a downturn in the economy because we're able to bring in those young startup companies, <coughs> help them to build and prepare so that they're stable by the time they get here. Sounds fantastic. We have some questions. John. Um, I'd just like you to speak to um, the initiatives for international uh, commerce. What a great question. Uh, we have an international team that is second to none. They are out there every single day um, in, in the community talking to businesses about a couple of things. First is how we help Maryland businesses export, and that's our, Mar our Export Maryland program, working closely with our federal partners. We get grants and we get um, companies 
funds to be able to go to different types of trade shows um, across across the world. And that's been very, very beneficial. Uh, the governor um, and um, the Department of Commerce and I went to Australia, for example, um, in September, and we were able to visit one of the projects of an Export Maryland um, team. And that was, um, do you know about that? Uh, about that? Yeah, so it, it was really exciting. They were able to get their first contract, a million dollar contract with the Sydney, um, uh, from the Olympics. Kyle, what was the name of that facility? I know, my mind is a blank right now. It was a very busy trip. It seats 100,000 people. So wow. a Maryland company got the bid to do the um, temporary uh, layover on the turf to be able to protect that. They went out there on an export Maryland trip and got introduced to this company and then got a million dollar contract and now they're on the road to be in an international business. So we do that with companies every day. So if anybody wants to be able to have that export capability, let us know. The other side of that, of course, is trying to get companies to ha have a uh, U.S. headquarters in Maryland. And that's another thing that we have a, a group of international folks that work on that in order to be able to attract those types of businesses as well. And that includes some trade missions that we'll do with the governor. Um, now that the governor is the chair of the National Governors Association, sometimes we'll bring other governors and their staff along with us in order to be able to look at those international opportunities. You're welcome. Len. What does the state able to do with, say, the city of Baltimore? All you hear is what the murder count is and that type of thing. And I know I've been to other events here where people talk about development in this area. That's going to be a negative impact on our state, influenced by the city. And you say headquarters coming here, but how many headquarters? key executives and their family want to come here when they, the, the view they have is so negative yeah. about our area. And what, if anything, can you do about that at the state level? Good question. Well, it's a great question, and um, if everybody else wasn't thinking that same question, um, I'm, I'd be surprised, right? So we're all thinking of that question all the time, every day. So I guess the simplest answer I can say is the Department of Commerce really can't do anything about what's happening with the crime in Baltimore, right, at the Department of Commerce. I, I know that it's a very, very important topic for the governor, and I know that he has had um, many conversations with the mayor, members of the council, um, members of the state delegation about what to do um, in Baltimore. So I'm not going to speak to that part of it, except to say that I have spoken with many, many of the companies that are down here, and we see all their names on the buildings talking about what their vision and their view is. And um, from a commerce, from a business perspective, yes, I acknowledge that it's more difficult for us to talk to businesses about moving to the state of Maryland because even when we're um, in another state, particularly even if we're, in, especially if we're in another country, they think that Maryland is Baltimore, mm -hmm. right? That there are no other parts of Maryland except for Baltimore. Mm. And they say, your city. And it's like, well, we have many cities. Which city are you referring to? You know, your city, Baltimore. And so... For us, we have, as, as I mentioned before, we have our, um, our public-private partnership to do marketing, and we market the entire state, right? So we need to talk about the entire state and get people to focus on the positives that are happening from Oakland to Ocean City, is what I like to say, and from Cecil County all the way down to St. Mary's County. And I think that's a big part of what we have to do. The other part is, you know, the, the, the folks, and this might be a little controversial, so I apologize for that, but... All of the businesses down here that are working on this every single day, I, I get um, confronted, I'll use that word, by the squeegee kids just like everybody else does. And it is the bane of my existence. I, I dread coming into the city sure. because of that. And if I didn't have to, I probably wouldn't. So um, I think what there has to be is there has to be the businesses that are down here that I have heard have a difficult time um, recruiting new talent to come into the city and, and everything on different spectrums. They have to be a little bit more demanding, I think, of what's happening in the city government. 
I think that there needs to be somebody that's going to be able to put their foot down and the business community has to say, you know, this is what we want. This is where we need to go. And hopefully at some point in time, they'll do that. I don't think it's, I don't think it's the job of the Department of Commerce yeah. to do that, but I, I would hope that businesses would would but want something to change. It does impact, it impacts our ability to recruit. Yes, well, we, it we, most definitely does. We had Augie Teixeira here a couple years ago, you know, president of m and in, in the, this mid-market arena. And he talked about, we talked about that same problem, you know, with the Freddie Gray incident, you know, several years ago. And he said, there's a concept, you know, we talked about perceptual reality, you know, we were on national news and everybody thought, the, you know, I got calls from relatives on the West Coast, are you okay? You know, they thought the whole state was blowing up. But, the, you know, it was a microcosm. It was a couple right. streets downtown. <clears throat> and yes, they had some problems, but it wasn't the entire state. And I guess that's what you're talking about. You right. know, it's getting that word out. And yes, there may be a little bit of a problem, and there is. But here's, the, here's what else we have to offer in the state of America. We have to acknowledge that it's there, right? When you have 283, I guess, homicides, I... You know, I get the update every morning from WBAL, and it's, it gets sadder and sadder every morning, right? Sure. When, you, when you have that, you can't ignore it, but you also have to try to accentuate the positive, right? right? Accentuate the positives that we have. And I am, I am typically not a, a pessimistic person. I'm typically very, very optimistic. And I, I have the wonderful advantage of having, for the last five years, traveled to so many different parts of the state and seen so many amazing, extraordinary, significant people and programs um, that make a big difference. And I think those stories sometimes do not get told in a way that they need to get told. Um, and just very briefly, because this is kind of a part of the vision for the Department of Commerce, is how do we tell the stories that are success stories? Or do we want to just hear on WBAL every morning <laughs> the, the bad stuff that's, that's happened? That's right. right. What is that success story that's coming out of the departments that are doing really amazing work every single day? Right. $40 million yesterday, DHCD's uh, um, Department of Housing and Community Developments, their neighborhood small business fund just reached $40 million that they're giving to small businesses on Main Street small businesses, right? That's significant. I didn't hear about that on WBL this morning, but I saw the press release yesterday. So they're not reporting on that. Hmm. How many reports do we hear? I hear Marty sometimes talking on the radio in his advertisements about vehicles for change and about the significance that they have on people's lives. But is that talked about routinely? Is that there was 283 murders, that's bad, but hey, guess what? We have 10 ex-offenders that are now getting their life together and they're you know, creating magic and wonderful things that happen for people that don't have anything. Right. And we're not hearing those. So what is that? what do our stories mean in the minds of being able to get them out to other people? And we have that same problem in economic <coughs> development as a whole because people think, just like you said, Doug, People heard about the Marriott deal, right? People have heard about the Northrop Grumman deal because those are big deals. Those are multi-million dollar deals. But the Department of Commerce isn't just about those multi-million dollar deals. They're about the smaller businesses. They're about real life people that are getting, you know, some of these programs up and running so that they can, Tenable, right? Who's heard of Tenable? I mean, now they're, you know, a ginormous company, but they started out as a small company exactly here in Maryland, right. and they got the assistance of, of some state resources, and they they got very good at what they did, and now um, they are what they are. George Davis always says we need 10 tenables. Well, I'll say, you know, we might need 100 tenables. We might have to get more past this. But it's about, it's it's not just about the names on the buildings down here, right? It's, it's about a lot of other things. And all those jobs that we created, the 126,000 jobs that were created over the last five years, it's not about a number. It's about the people that are actually working in those jobs. That's right. It's about the people that maybe for the first time are able to collect a paycheck that gives them a little bit more, more money so that they can buy a car, they can have increased mobility, or they can put a down payment on a house, Right? Or they can maybe get a program for their kid that they weren't able to get a program before that's going to be beneficial to them. And it's about creating that economic growth and that economic prosperity personally. And at the Department of Commerce, we call that prosperity with purpose. Because without giving the story of purpose, then everything else kind of steps in front of it and it negates all of those positive things that are happening. Well stated. Suzanne. 
Hi, I was wondering what kind of initiatives um, are you pushing forward specifically for women? These are the major women, are the commerce issues that you're pushing forward for women business owners? Uh, specifically, yes, there are, uh, and it was it was before I got here actually. Um, so we do have um, uh, loan programs. Um, we call them our VLT loans, but it's a small women, small women, small minority women owned business, Swoboda, but or for short, we say VLT because it comes from our video lottery terminals. They were funded through um, for, through that. So we call it our VLT funds. There's eight fund managers across the state that are specifically there to um, provide those kind of set aside type loans to sometimes the smallest of businesses that may be highest risk that they will not be able to go to a traditional lender in order to be able to receive. A, um, an additional, um, Ms. Bidfa, I don't know what that one stands for either, but it's also for Maryland, small minority women owned business, so all of those set asides as well. And it's a larger fund that's managed by um, MMG, a partner in, in Baltimore, that does that specifically for the women, um, women and minority businesses. How about guys? What do we have? <laughs> Marty. So, Secretary, obviously, Maryland is made great strides since the governor's been in place, and you've been a big part of that, being Secretary of Labor and in Commerce. So is there a chance that we'll see you run for governor? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of question? Who next? let him in next. the room? <laughs> <laughs> I am so busy right now, Marty. I, I, it's, it's all I can do to figure out what I'm doing on my calendar here at the Department of Commerce every day. But you are obviously a very talented woman, and you, in a couple years, who knows? But uh, you're very, very impressive. Steve. A uh, quick question regarding gambling revenue. Um, what's been the overall impact of that? How, how has that really helped education, some of the initial initiatives? I guess, you know, when I turn on the TV and they're buying box students at schools, you know, it goes through my mind of, hey, really, what's going on? So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Are the funds really being directed based on the intent? Okay, so there's a lot of questions in there. So I'm going to try because I because I don't. I, I don't have control over their budget, and I don't really focus on their budget enough. Having come from the legislature, when those types of bills were passed, I can talk to you about what the intent was and, and where it's going now. Obviously, the, um, the casino revenues are increasing, um, which is a good thing. Um, a portion of that uh, those revenue proceeds from the video lottery terminals specifically were um, supposed to go to our VLT funds to be able to help small minority women-owned businesses. It's not going there anymore. Three years ago, that money was diverted in the legislature to go to um, educational funding. So that money was diverted. So they have some funds in their fund balances now because obviously their loan programs are being repaid and it's you know just kind of a, a progressive fund. Um, so as far as that's concerned, I can speak directly on that. Um, the overall big picture is yes, that money does go into the educational trust fund, but because of the state law, the way that the amount of money that has to go in there based on the state funding percentages, that money is going in there, but more general fund is not going in there. So there's not necessarily. And as, and as it pertains to specific counties in the box fan issue, I can't relate to that because I think those are individual decisions budgetary decisions that are made by individual county school boards on how to utilize the funds that they have because every single year more money goes into the education fund. It's never decreased. It's always increased every single year, but it's, it's a question as to how much, how, how much they're putting into different parts of their line items basically for those types of Events. That was basically skirting the question, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you also mentioned something interesting. You said, you know, when we look at different states and you're doing some benchmarking and tax rates, and if I heard you clearly, you'd be like, well, maybe if we're not able to match those tax rates, there's some benefits. Right. So, 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 so my question around that is why not just look at the tax rate and then let's be competitive with that? 
to stand up. Just having credits here, credits there. Let's just get right. To it. it sounds like my campaign speech from ten years ago when I was in when I was running for the House of Delegates. I mean, right? So that's that's a really good question. And so some people have done that. I mean, every single year there's a bill by somebody, I think I put it in three times that I was in the legislature, to reduce the corporate tax rate so it would be competitive with our nemesis, which is Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, every single year it gets a very um, polite hearing and then you never hear about it ever again because nobody wants to deal mm -hmm. with that part of it. And so the, the reality is, is the executive branch has to operate under the laws that are set by the legislature. We can't change the tax rate. We would like to. I know the governor has been very supportive of looking at different ways to create different tax platforms. And when you look at how the states are all ranked and every there's a hundred publications that come out with state rankings depending on something. And Maryland is moving up in a lot of those rankings, but we're not going to be able to move up in the rankings simply by having somebody possibly qualify for a tax credit, right? And so that's, I think, we, we get it. And we would like to be able to change that tax structure, but, um, but apparently the legislature does not want to decrease the corporate tax rate. I just can't figure it out. <laughs> However, our nemesis to the South, otherwise known as Virginia, they, um, it, big news, when I talked about the jobs that were created in September, or, um, August and September, Maryland is now 100 jobs more created than the state of Virginia Yay. during this year. That's exciting, there right? I mean, uh, Virginia's a pretty big state, so we have increased both the actual numbers and the percentages of the state of Virginia. Virginia is for lovers, though. Who else got a question? <laughs> Any other questions? Asilios. Secretary, let's go back to the Baltimore thing. FYI, I was born down the street, grew up in Baltimore. I'm vested in this place here, so you go back to the Baltimore thing again. As I recall, the opportunity zone has improved the whole city, right? Something like that. Almost, yeah. Almost, right. So I guess my question is always recognizing that um, why don't we check on the, the benefits and credits for this specific year so that it's so impossible to ignore? Because the flip side of what you said is that you say let the business owners stand up and say something. Well, they stand up when President Trump says, hey, bro, whatever. Right, and they say Baltimore's great, and they put up a platform to say Baltimore's great, and then they don't address the issue. Right, you run TV ads and say Baltimore's great, but we don't solve the issue. So I don't care how many ads you run. I agree with you that we should have more, uh, you know, ads that basically say here's a successful rate. But by ignoring the problem, we're not doing anything about it. So why not juice up what credits they have right here? They acknowledge the problem exists. They give them so much incentive, they have no choice but to go for that. Because people want for that. Right? They love that. Right? I agree with you. People do love tax credits and incentives. I would say when we talk to businesses, it's not their number one concern. When we talk to um, when we talk to the business community, and you have site selectors that come into the state. Um, wanting to look at different geographical areas. Their number one question is, can I get workforce? Is there the talent that's there in order to be able to provide us and feed us with the skilled talent that we need? And then is it a place in an environment where I want myself and my family to move to? And it tax incentives is kind of like fourth, fifth on the list of things that they're looking at. So. We, we have to look at all of those equally, I think. And I believe with the incentives, the city has been a great partner with us when we talk about um, their, uh, the mayor's um, economic development office uh, working with us. There's a lot that the city offers as well. So when we talk about increasing the, the level of incentives, they're already increased two or three times um, because of the bill that was passed last year for the opportunity zones for the stackable incentives. So for example, you can get maybe double your tax credit with more jobs for Marylanders if you're in an opportunity zone. So that's exciting because people are gonna look at opportunity zones. There's some great opportunity zones that are happening around, around the city right now, Yard 56 and, and others. I'm sure many of you have known about that. 
but there's there's all of that that is happening and people are taking advantage of that but we need to look at it at a holistic level and it's going to be hard for me to say but just you know like the educational system you're not going to fix any of it just by money alone you know there's so many things that are going to have to go into it in order to understand that it's it's a holistic type of effort that needs to be made. Well, I agree with you there. There's a whole commission that seems to disagree with the government about that. I, I've read it. I've read all about it. Yes. Morning uh, bashing him for not showing up at a meeting where they could spend all day bashing. Well. It, I will not opine on that, but knowing, but knowing that that commission has been up and running for at least three years, um, and this is the first invitation that the governor has received in order to be able to attend, um, I think is telling. Um, I was the Secretary of Labor, dealt very, very closely with education, training, workforce. I was never invited to attend wow. to give my opinion as the Secretary of Labor on the uh, on any of the trades programs that they were talking about, any of that. So I won't opine on it, though. I'll just give you the facts. Speaking about the mayor's office, Mayor Pugh and so forth, did that whole situation with what happened several months ago with her, does that hurt in terms, again, perspective with existing businesses here in Maryland as well as attracting other businesses that come to the state? I think that was a blip. You know, the, the Mayor Pew thing, I don't think it has a lasting effect right now, um, that specific instance. I think the idea of um, elected officials and politicians in general being... Um, Suspect. <laughs> wanting them to have integrity and wanting them, you know, to be all about the community and public service as opposed to otherwise. I think, I think that's what people want. You know, it, and reading in the paper, you know, one of my former colleagues that I worked with in, it, um, in the General Assembly, and she resigned last month because of some impropriety that she had in the county that she was serving. And all of that just builds up over a period of time, and people wonder why there's not more voter participation in the state. It's because <laughs> you're afraid to do your part to elect somebody that's crooked, right? And I, and I don't, I, I, I get that. That's a, uh, that's, that's a big issue. But I think the Mayor Pew situation doesn't help what's happening in the city of Baltimore, but as far as perceptions are concerned, but I don't think that she individually, that's a long-term type thing where people are going to continually talk about it. Any other questions? For There's the more elections secretary? coming. Um, I want to ask you a question before you leave here. Oh, no. oh did we lose somebody? <laughs> You're obviously a well, very well-rounded individual, the type of things that you've done. But, you know, people in here are business owners, what made you leave the business environment? You were a partner in a cybersecurity firm. Yeah. You're in business. What caused that transition back into where you are now? Service became a delegate. You decided to serve. Governor Hogan, quite frankly. So when I was a member of the House of Delegates, that's only a part-time job. So when you serve in the House, you serve for 90 days continuously during the legislative session. But outside of that, um, the rest of the nine months, you you know serve constituencies, right? So you're back in your home district, and you have somebody that helps you, and you go to firehouse dinners and stuff like that. But um, but I had a full time job. I was a uh, director of a, a program with a defense company, um, so I did that while I was a delegate. So. I was going to continue to do that in 2015 when I won my second election in November of 2014. And working two jobs was great for me. It worked out really well, particularly the last year when I worked with a partner to start up the cyber company. And I left the, um, the defense company. And we started that. We finally got all of our um, necessary approvals done by the NSA to start utilizing our service within their very thick walls of <laughs> trying to get through that. Um, so that was very, very successful. And then the election happened, got reelected. The governor got elected, yay, 2015, Republican governor. That was amazing. That was good. I've known the governor for several years prior to that. Um, but uh, he called me into his office and when he was going through transition, and he said, Delegate, 
If you were to do anything in this administration, what is it that you think that you would do? And I'm like, well, I love my two jobs that I have. I love being a delegate. Being a delegate is a really cool job. It's, you just get to meet so many really interesting people in your neighborhood and in your community and all the intricate details of what's happening. And um, so I said, well, I really love my two jobs, Governor. And I, I started this business, and, you know, it's really great. We haven't made any money yet. We're out there, and we're marketing <laughs> it. And we got all of our necessary approvals and certifications, and it's all really good, and we're going we're gonna to go gangbuster. And I said, but if I were to do anything in this administration, the only thing that I would do would be the secretary of the Department of Labor Licensing and Regulations. And he looked at me, and he said, why in the hell would you want to be the secretary of the Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation? That's like the worst agency in the entire state. Everybody gets mad at them all the time. <laughs> and I said, I know, I know. That's why I want to go there, because they have the potential to be great. And we can make them great, and we can change the culture. And it's such an important part of the business environment and the business community to know that they have a partner in that agency. And I think we can make a difference. So... So I've been kind of tied up in that for the last five years, but going back to the private sector at some point in time is really good. <laughs> be exciting. But, you know, that's what's so fascinating. You, know, you look at you know, the founding fathers and so forth of our country. You know, people served as a part-time job, yes. and they sacrificed, and there was, right. no, there was no payment for that. It was never that's seen right. that somebody be there 20, 30, 40 years and be that for their entire life. That's right. So, I mean, it's, sometimes you wish you could go back. Any other questions? For the secretary. One final one that I have for you, Secretary Kelly. Not that we're going to take Marty's question, but <laughs> if you were the governor, what would, what would you do differently? If, you know, what's your vision? What's your vision from him? He asked you, what would you do for if you had your, your slot and you said Department of Labor? What could be done differently? Yeah, I, I, I have no idea. Honestly, I, I can... I knew when I came into the Department of Commerce that there were there was a, there was a vision, there was a personal way that I could do something, and and no matter what I do, um, whether it be you know a Republican delegate from Frederick County that worked very closely with my Democratic chair, and you know we became you know kind of partners in, in doing some really good things in the legislature, you have to put your personal touch on it, what exactly that would be. I, I have no idea. I haven't even considered that. But each and every one of us has our own personal touch that we would put onto something. Just, I, I can't really speak as to what that would be. I think you have a very good personal touch, Secretary Kelly. Thank you for being with us. See you all next meeting.